There are those born among us who act as a beacon, shining a light on certain aspects of our culture that are frequently overlooked or misunderstood. Leonard Roy Frank was one of those illuminating spirits, an American human rights activist, writer, editor, aphorist, lecturer, and survivor of psychiatric abuse. His legacy lies in his dedication and unwavering commitment to truth, in elevating social consciousness to the abuses of electroshock and psychiatric drug therapy. In this insightful, informative interview, filmed in 2009, but now released for the first time, Leonard speaks to us about his own personal experience of shock treatment, as well as of the experience of those other thousands who might have suffered the same abuses while under mandatory psychiatric care. This film is intended not just as a commemoration of the life and work of Leonard Roy Frank, but as a reminder of the many victims of abuses still living across the nation, as well as the spirits of the past who have been forgotten to time. Out of the great injustices done to them, this film seeks to allow their voices to be heard, even beyond their graves. With their help, Leonard's story will resonate for remedial change for generations to come. Well, I'm going to have to go back a little bit in time here, before the gallery, uh, back, uh, as a matter of fact, to 1959 when I first came out to San Francisco. And at that time I was uh, interested in real estate. I wanted to be a real estate salesman in San Francisco, which is what I had been doing in New York and Florida for the two or three previous years after getting out of the Army. When I came out to San Francisco, I was uh, 27 or 28 years old and uh, immediately studied and, and got myself a real estate license so I could practice here. I had a job which had been assured to me once I had the real estate license. And for the first uh, two or three months on the job, uh, I was very satisfied with doing that kind of work. I wasn't particularly successful. I wasn't successful at all, but I had a job, was doing that. But then I began to get interested in other things that were a little bit beyond real estate. As a matter of fact, a whole lot beyond real estate. I got interested in, in religion and philosophy and spirituality and politics and history and reading the Bible and, and the book one book particularly turned me around, and that was the autobiography of Mahatma Gandhi. And he was uh, someone who was trying to fuse religion and politics. That was his purpose, that was his role in life. And I saw that as a noble objective. Uh, the problem was that I didn't know a damn thing about <laughs> religion or politics other than what I picked up in my daily doings, but I had never studied either subject. So I felt it was really necessary for me to study those two subjects in a way that uh, was very different from anything that I had done before. My preparations had been uh, for the business world. I had been a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton School there, which is a well-known business school. And that's what I was prepared to do. And then suddenly I lost interest in that when I became interested, interested in the other things. And uh, I began to do a lot of reading on very serious subjects. And I, uh, because Gandhi had mentioned uh, uh, Henry David Thoreau and the essay on civil disobedience, I went ahead and read that. And I read uh, some Emerson, and I read uh, the Bhagavad Gita, Gita, which was a book that strongly influenced Gandhi. And then, of course, he referred to the New Testament in the Bible. And I thought, well, if these books impressed him, that I would go ahead and begin my study course by reading the things that had had a great influence on him. So the, one of the first books I went to after that was uh, the Bible. And uh, I figured that if he was uh, taken up with the New Testament, that the Old Testament was the basis for the New Testament, maybe I ought to start there. So I read the Old Testament for the first time. I was born and raised a Jew, had never been religious at all. But now I began to see that there was a lot of substance in the Bible. 
began to take it very seriously, not in a literal way, but because of the essential ideas, the essential truths that I discovered in that book. Uh, what you have to do, or what I had to do, was to separate uh, the, the, uh, the gold from the dross. And that's what I did it during those early months of my study course. And then I got interested in politics and read uh, uh, books about Abraham Lincoln. I read uh, a number of collections of his writings, his speeches, and his letters, and, and also read Arnold Toynbee and Henry Bergson and Joseph Campbell. These are just names that are coming to me right now. People who had a tremendous influence on me, and that coupled with Gandhi's ideas on nonviolence and how to bring about creative social change through acts of civil disobedience, that made all the sense in the world because it was just so clear to me that changing society through violence was not going to work at all and hadn't been working and that we needed a new approach for a new world. And I adopted uh, Gandhi's nonviolence and he, seeing that he was a vegetarian, I began studying vegetarianism and became a vegetarian myself. I went one step further than Gandhi. I became a vegan eventually. A vegan being someone who not only doesn't eat, uh, doesn't eat meat or fish products, but doesn't eat any kind of animal products, whatever. In other words, no cheese, no eggs, no milk, nothing like that. And uh, for the next two or three years, I just uh, sort of holed up in my apartment, uh, drawing books from the library and buying secondhand books from used bookstores, and uh, acquired quite a library and a, and a very much different view from the view that I had before. I began to really reevaluate everything that I thought. Nothing escaped my attention in terms of my own personal beliefs. Nothing was just accepted on the basis of the fact that I had believed these things. I had to investigate some of the teachings, some of the ideas, some of the beliefs I had, I held on to. Then there were others that I dropped completely and adopted new ones for myself. Well, during this period, my parents were very uh, concerned about these changes that I was going through. I saw these changes as very positive. I was growing, developing, and becoming more aware, broadening my consciousness, broadening my sensitivity, my feelings of warmth and compassion for other people, whereas previously I'd been very closed and narrow-minded. Although I didn't realize it at the time, now I saw that as something that was holding me back from becoming the person I felt I could be. Again, getting back to my parents, uh, these changes were unwelcome in the extreme. And they thought that they signaled uh, a deterioration of my personality, what in psychiatry is spoken of as a personality change, a very negative concept. I saw personality change as a very positive concept in my own case. My parents urged me to see a psychiatrist, and I wasn't interested in having anything to do with psychiatrists, although at that point I had done some reading in Jung and Freud and Eric Fromm and believed that all three of them had a real contribution to my understanding, but that none of them had the complete answer. I was most influenced by Jung. Uh, uh, he was a Swiss psychiatrist who different, differed from Freud in very important ways. Uh, Jung was much more spiritually oriented and Freud was much more oriented to um, traumas and early life experiences and human sexuality. But Jung separated from Freud because of their differences in worldview and their personal differences as well. They weren't getting along after a certain point because Freud was a very domineering personality and Jung was a very independent-minded person and he just wouldn't knuckle under to the, Freud, the authority of Sigmund Freud or anyone else for that matter. After a while, uh, uh, my parents, because I seemed to be so determined not to see any psychiatrist or psychotherapist, uh, 
they felt it was really necessary for uh, the psychiatrist to see me, to evaluate me, and and uh, to uh, uh, give me treatment that would change me back to the person I had been, the person they felt very good about, who I no longer felt very good about. It's not that I was totally against the person that I had been, but I recognized the person I had been as someone who was going through a certain phase of my development. And now I was growing out of that phase and into a new phase, and I was leaving behind that other person. Well, I wouldn't see the psychiatrist, so they arranged to have the psychiatrist see me. And the only way you could do that at that time, and even today, was to have me committed to a psychiatric institution. And that's what happened in October of 19... 62. And it was right around, literally within days of the Cuban Missile Crisis, that I was locked up, brought first to a hospital here in San Francisco, and then uh, sent to an apostate hospital where I remained for five or six weeks, during which period they tried to get me to take psychiatric drugs and undergo electroshock. And I wouldn't cooperate with them. So eventually it was decided that I would be sent to a private sanitarium named Twin Pines Sanitarium or Hospital, I'm not sure the exact title, which was located in Belmont, which is just a, a few miles south of San Francisco. And it was there again that they tried to convince me to undergo shock treatment. I wasn't interested in that and I wasn't interested in really talking uh, with any of the, the so-called therapists or psychiatrists there about myself in a personal way. I was being, by their terms, very evasive. And that was held against me as a symptom of my mental illness. And eventually they had me labeled as a, a paranoid schizophrenic, which is uh, on just about the most serious, the most damaging psychiatric label that can be put on another person. And it usually is the justification for imposing any kind of unwanted so-called medical treatment on, on that individual. In my case, what they wanted to do was administer insulin coma electroconvulsive treatment, which was a combination of electroshock treatment and insulin coma. Insulin coma was a, a form of shock treatment that was used even before electroshock was introduced. And it was mostly abandoned because it was so damaging and it was a very, complica a very complicated procedure that required a lot of nursing and was not as convenient to, to use as electroshock was. And it also had a high death rate, which was not uh, as serious a problem with electroshock. But I was one of the last uh, people, or this institution was one of the last institutions that was using electroshock in 1962. Uh, two or three years later, it had been practically dropped from uh, the armamentarium that psychiatrists use to control and damage and, and punish people who they saw as mentally ill. Now the reason why I'm able to tell you uh, some of these things is that uh, I was able to get my records in 1971 or 72, 150 pages, some odd pages of psychiatric records and these records revealed that I had had uh, 50, electro, uh, 50 insulin coma treatments and 35 electroshock treatments, all against my will, but with a court order which uh, authorized their doing that to me in spite of my resistance to their treatment. And a lot of that was based on the fact that I was not cooperating with them. Uh, the medical examiners, there were two of them who initially committed me and had to sign these papers saying that I was a mentally ill person. They, they said that I was, uh, that I wasn't working, that I had grown a beard, that I was eating only vegetarian foods, uh, and that, and this, these are the exact words, I was living the life of a beatnik to a certain extent. Now this was just before the beatnik era, really was in its most uh, uh, glorious period, if you want to call it that. 
So that's the way they saw me as a, as a beatnik or someone who was likely to become a beatnik. Um, you know, I, I misstated that. I said it was just before the beatnik era. It actually was the tail end of the beatnik era, and it was the beginning of the hippie area, era. It was the hippie era, era that I was stepping into. But because that was not a popular term at that stage, uh, they, they used the word beatnik, and that was something that was identified with people in San Francisco who were dissidents, who were poets, who were uh, people who went to the drug scene and, uh, who, you know, were not being conformists. We're not living up to the, uh, the American ideal of the hardworking individual who had a family and more or less uh, went along and, and uh, did whatever they could to succeed materially in the world. So that was uh, the, the, the slot into which I was placed, and it became the justification, the rationalization for their depriving of me of my freedom, and then for their using these very brutal techniques to uh, convince me that I should uh, give up my, uh, my ways and, and adopt the ways of the more traditional society. Well, at the end of this uh, period of maybe six or seven weeks during which I had all these shock treatment, I was just totally wiped out. And uh, during one of the shock treatments, they actually shaved off my beard. That was a part of uh, my uh, nonconformity. And they thought that that was something that was hampering me and that it needed to be uh, removed if I was to become a normal person again by their standards. Uh, they also said, uh, according to the records, they, they had all these symptoms listed, reports by nurses and doctors and whatnot as to what was wrong with me. And the way they identified my problems by, was by labeling them as symptoms. And one of the symptoms was uh, negativism. Another symptom was uh, um, my vegetarian idiosyncrasies. That was the exact phrase that they used. And then there was... Uh, the fact that I had piercing eyes and uh, was not very communicative and didn't have any insight, which has a special meaning in psychiatry. Lack of insight means that you don't know you're crazy. Like I was not acknowledging the fact that was all so obvious to them that I was a lunatic, that I was a mad person, that I was a schizophrenic, uh, this very derogatory term that they have for the people who they regard as the most psychotic, the most mentally ill. They, then they also said that I had religious preoccupations, a very broad term like I had. Apparently, I don't remember this, of course, because my memory for this entire period was just wiped out. Not only for the period during which I was institutionalized, but for the period of maybe two and a half years preceding the shock treatment, because here it was in May of 1962 that I had my last shock treatment. And I didn't know that the President of the United States was John F. Kennedy, although he had been elected President two and a half years before. That was the extent of the uh, uh, damage, but that was only a part of it. It also had effectively destroyed my high school and college educations. Everything that I had learned during this wonderful period of growth, uh, during the two and a half year period, was wiped out like, like uh, a wet eraser going across a heavily chalked blackboard. It was just like that. But then there were big chunks of my memory that were gone from the entire period of my life. And those memories never returned. Now I relearned a lot of things that happened to me through conversations with people who knew me during that period. I remembered vaguely some of the courses, some of the teachers that I had studied with and some of the experience, personal experiences that I had outside of the classroom. But basically, I, I was reduced to the level of about an eighth grader, education-wise, and in terms of my learning. So after being released from the institution, having promised that I would see a, a therapist uh, after I had relocated myself in San Francisco, which I never did, and after promising or assuring them in some way that I would continue to take the drugs that they were giving me after the shock treatment. And uh, I took the drugs, took the prescription, 
I never took another pill, psychiatric pill, since that time. I just threw that all down the, the toilet bowl where it belonged. But I had to reckon with uh, my, my losses and my, debilita my, uh, my deficits because not only had my memory been greatly damaged, but when you suffer from brain damage like that, that is sufficient to cause such memory loss, there is also an equivalent loss of one's ability to learn, to acquire new memories and retain those memories. And that has been a problem that I've had since that time, which was uh, you know, now more than 40 years ago, 44 years ago. Now, it was only through real diligence on my part that I reacquired the knowledge uh, that I had lost during my previous life. And what it entailed was reading uh, all these books. Uh, most of the time I was able to acquire the books that I wanted to read. And right away I went back to the books that I had the vaguest memory of having read during the two and a half year period. There were maybe four or five names, the names that I had given you before. I went right back to their books, reread them, and started the whole journey over again. And that again was a very exciting time uh, with all the, the, the problems that the shock treatment caused. Uh, it was still exciting to get back into the learning process again. And uh, because my memory was so problematic, uh, I felt it was necessary to keep notes on everything that I read. So I have these notebooks up here of the best ideas from the books that I read. And then I have other notebooks right there behind you uh, in which I uh, listed all the new words that I was learning. And I, what I did was, just rather than list the words at random, I organized them by categories, by subject. And then I organized them by nouns and verbs and adjectives. And then I uh, made it a point to group the words uh, within particular categories that related to subcategories within, within the categories. And I found this to be a tremendously useful tool because just in the process of writing out the words and, and thinking about the way individual words related to other words and getting it all down on paper and then rewriting because after a while the, the categories, I would, do, I would put together like eight columns on a page and after a while the categories would be pretty chaotic and I'd have to reorganize the categories to keep them straight. But in the very process of reorganizing the categories, I was able to imprint these words on my memory much better than would have been the case had I not done it that way. So I did that for five or six years. And of course, I read things that I had never read before, but it all started from the things that I had begun to read during this two and a half year period before I was locked up. But I remember very, very clearly one of the first memories that I had uh, after coming out of the shock treatment was that what has happened to me was something that was fundamentally wrong and evil and that this shouldn't be done to anyone. And that if I ever had the chance to fight this thing I would do it. And that was the first thing I resolved, first thing I remember resolving after coming out of the last shock treatment. And for a while I didn't have much of a chance to do that. I was just busy reacquiring the information and the knowledge that I had lost. But then I went to work for a friend of mine who had an art gallery in downtown San Francisco. And I worked there for about a, you know, maybe a couple of months and I helped my friend move from that old location to the location on Stockton Street where I eventually met Mark Mullion. And uh, at that time I was already beginning to, to reach out with my th theories and beliefs about the harmfulness of psychiatry. And I would make up these uh, flyers uh, with quotations about psychiatrists and what they do, mostly from their own writings, and how harmful and destructive it was. And I would pass out the literature to people who came into the art gallery. It was totally irrelevant to what my, uh, 
main business was there. Like they didn't come into the gallery looking for information about psychiatry. They came into the gallery for to relax and and be inspired by paintings. But I did that, and I carried that on once I opened my own gallery. And it was there that I began to um, do it on a larger scale. Like I would have a whole bunch of leaflets and flyers on one of the tables in the gallery, and people could pick those things up freely. And uh, eventually uh, I began talking to people about psychiatry, and I found people who shared my point of view and others who were very critical. But it was a way of sort of bringing me in contact with the public, which was very valuable to me. Uh, that went on. I had the gallery for five years. And another very significant thing happened uh, during the early, well, several very significant things happened relating to my work in uh, this criticism of psychiatry that I had. And one of the things that happened was that I uh, saw a letter in the New York Times or I saw an article, rather, in the New York Times uh, about Thomas Sass. And Thomas Sass had been very helpful to me indirectly because I had run across uh, a magazine article by him in 1964, just a year or so after I had gotten out of the institution, which was all about psychiatry. And he verbalized the very things that I had felt and believed about psychiatry, and here is someone who was in the field of psychiatry himself. And I was just amazed that someone like that, someone of his stature, would come up with the same attitudes and the same beliefs that I had. So from that point on, I began reading uh, voraciously everything I could get my hands on that was by or about Thomas Sass. And I had done a lot of reading of Thomas Sass's books up to that, up to 1972 or so. And I think he had at that point, seven or eight books, and I read almost all of them. And this helped shape my understanding of psychiatry in a way that I probably could not have done had I just uh, gone about my study of the subject at random, studying a writer here, a writer there. He sort of put it all together for me. And as a result of that, I developed a tremendous respect for him. Well, when I saw this article in the New York Times, I decided to send him a letter. Uh, and I don't even re remember what point I made. It was some, something to do with that article that I was in disagreement with. And I wanted to bring that to his attention. And he sent me back a very nice note saying that he agreed with whatever it was that I had said. And that began a, a correspondence. And soon after that, um, uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, if he were ever in the San Francisco area, I would be willing to uh, uh, help set up a speaking engagement for him. And sure enough, just a few months after that, as I recall, uh, he announced to me that he was going to be in Los Angeles and was coming up to San Francisco, and that if I wanted to go ahead and arrange for a speaking engagement at such and such day when he would be in San Francisco, that I was uh, welcome to do that. So I rented a, a, a church downtown and printed up tickets and posters and got a little bit of publicity. I didn't do a very good job on that because I wasn't uh, familiar with the way to go about it at that time. And uh, he came into the city. We met and we got along very well. And I had uh, developed a, a schedule of uh, media engagements for him because at that time Thomas Sass was really rather quite well known as a critic of psychiatry and had quite an audience because he was so controversial. And uh, there must have been five or six radio stations and television stations that uh, wanted to have him on and I took him from place to place as, as he gave his interviews. Uh, and then uh, that evening or maybe the next evening he uh, gave this presentation at a church and we had about 400 people there, which was pretty good. And he gave a wonderful talk, and we spent some time together afterwards. And that really solidified our friendship, and we've been friends ever since that time. And we're in not frequent, but regular uh, uh, contact with each other, uh, mostly these days through email. Uh, let's see.
that was a, that that gave me a, a lot of hope for uh, the possibility of doing something constructive in this field of criticism of psychiatry. And it wasn't long after that that I became involved with a, a publication that was just starting at that time called Madness Network News. This was a publication, uh, a monthly or whenever they could get it together, they would come out with it and they would distribute it to the psychiatric wards all through the, the city of San Francisco and in the Bay Area at large. And this was a, a paper put together by uh, mental health workers. There were, well, was a psychiatrist involved, a social worker, three or four former uh, psychiatric inmates such as myself. And I got on board in this project maybe mm, maybe uh, after the first issue. I, didn't, I, I, I saw the first issue, but I didn't have anything to do with it. But I contributed an article or two, a very short article, to the second issue, which was being mimeographed. I mean, that's how crude this operation was. And the circulation never was more than, uh, even in its best days, was never more than 2,000 or so. But that got me involved in, in, in working for the publication and in meeting some people who shared my views about mental, and Thomas Sass's views about the myth of mental illness and the cruelty of forcing these very, very powerful psychiatric drugs uh, to say nothing of electroshock. I mean, that was going on then, uh, uh, probably even more than it is today. And uh, this journal or newspaper, whatever you want to call it, Madness Network News, all the fits that news to print. It was derived from the New York Times motto. Uh, that was communicating a, a particular point of view that was very uh, disrespectful and honest, uh, disrespectful of the psychiatric uh, uh, system and of the people who worked in that system uh, because we didn't recognize their labels as having any kind of medical uh, validity or, or scientific validity, whatever. And here they were uh, forcing these uh, very harmful brain damaging procedures on people against their will on the basis of a false belief system. Nonconformist and anti-traditional and uh, that the very fact that they were conducting themselves in that way was indicative of their having a brain disorder. <laughs> which, which was a leap in logic uh, that was hard to fathom, still is. So we, we uh, did, uh, did very well with our publication. We had it distributed uh, around the country on a small scale, but, uh, and in Europe and Canada as well. Uh, and we became the voice of what was then an emerging psychiatric survivors movement. And that was uh, a very wonderful time in, in terms of getting involved with other people who uh, wanted to fight this cruel system. So for about two years, we worked with Madness Network News, and there were six or seven of us who, who would put the, the publication together and distribute it. And my art gallery served as sort of the headquarters for that publication because it was conveniently located downtown in San Francisco. But then we had the feeling that, you know, it's really not just uh, not enough to fight this thing with a, um, um, a publication. We needed to go at this thing politically. And it was in early 1974 that a, a bunch of us got together and we decided to form the Network Against Psychiatric Assault, or NAPA. And NAPA was the acronym for it. And uh, we had great initial success through that organization. You may remember some of it yourself. And we had forums, we had meetings, and, and uh, we had demonstrations. Most importantly were these demonstrations. The demonstrations were at Langley Porter Neuropsychiatric Institute, which is a part of the UC, the University of California uh, Medical School complex. And uh, we were holding these demonstrations because we had gotten word from a medical doctor that they were forcing electroshock on some of their patients. And we saw that as particularly outrageous. I mean, it was outrageous enough that they were doing it to patients on a voluntary basis, but here we found out 
through inside information that they were actually forcing it on people. So we held a series of demonstra demonstrations and protests uh, in front of their uh, hospital. We wanted to have an open public debate. They weren't interested in that. Uh, but we got a lot of media attention. Uh, uh, my friend uh, Wade Hudson, he and I were co-founders of the Network Against Psychiatric Assault, and he was particularly good in getting media attention uh, by writing press releases and calling people up, and he had a lot of contacts uh, out, outside our circle of people within the psychiatric system. So, uh, and we would also get television coverage because these demonstrations were pretty interesting from a viewer's standpoint because not only would we be marching in front of the hospital but we would have an open mic where people would speak about their experiences with psychiatry not just with shock treatment at Langley Porter but their experiences with psychiatry in general the idea of being forcibly held down for example and being uh, inoculated with a very powerful antipsychotic drug which really wipes you out these are very very powerful mind-numbing drugs which can cause devastating damage to the individual's various bodily organs including the brain especially if taken over a, a reasonably long period of time in large doses which is the way they're administered today like today once you're put on one of these antipsychotic drugs for example uh, you can expect that the doctor will want you or the psychiatrist will want you to be on this drug for the rest of your life and these drugs, without a question, are brain damaging and life shortening and life diminishing and making it really impossible for people to get themselves together to move on to a higher and better place in their lives. So our work became political and uh, it began to have a larger effect than just the local community because eventually we had hearings on electroshock uh, at City Hall and uh, as a result of these hearings, which were all-day hearings, uh, there was uh, a moratorium held, uh, put on the use of electroshock in San Francisco, which lasted several years. So that was an accomplishment right there. And at the same time that we were organizing these demonstrations at Langley Porter and St. Mary's Hospital because they were doing other things, not shock treatment, but other things that we regarded as very, very cruel to, to inmates at their hospital, uh, uh, we also campaigned uh, in Sacramento for legislation that would restrict the use of electroshock and lobotomy or psychosurgical procedures. And through John Vasconcellos, who was a representative, I believe, from San Mateo County, we were able to introduce legislation that re restricted and regulated the use of electroshock and lobotomy-type operations throughout the state of California. So that was our major achievement, and we were the first state to do that. And ultimately, there were 32 or 33 other states which did the same thing, passing legislation some of it not as restrictive as we would like, but at least it was an attempt. It was putting the, the community and the state on notice that there were some problems with the use of electroshock and it, uh, it should, shouldn't be used uh, just uh, indiscriminately on anyone who the psychiatrist said uh, needed it. Now, our effect hasn't been that successful in limiting the use of electroshock from a, a legal basis, but there were a number of people undoubtedly who were alerted to the dangers of shock treatment through our work, through the publicity, through the attention in the media, who decided that, well, you know, maybe there's a better way to go than shock treatment. It seems like there are a lot of problems with this procedure. We'll, we'll try some alternative. But it didn't have any uh, uh, effect on the amount of drugging going on. As a matter of fact, the less electroshock that was being used, the more likely it was that the drugs would be resorted to which could be potentially almost or as devastating as electroshock. I mean, if you had a choice between a series of, of 10 or 12 electroshocks versus a lifetime of being on these antipsychotic drugs, you know, a wise choice might be to, to opt for the electroshock rather than a lifetime on, on the antipsychotic drugs in terms of the damage that it would do you. So, so we did good work in that area. We also had demonstrations against a, a, a government commission that was investigating psychosurgery.
And uh, that was helpful, we think, in, in restricting the use of psychosurgery because of all the attention that it got in the media. And then uh, we had a sleep-in at Governor Brown's office to uh, 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 identify a very serious problem in the state mental, ho health, mental hospital system. Like uh, the problem was that inmates were dying and they were dying from the use of drugs and restraints and often in combination with each other. And uh, we had a 30-day sleep-in at Governor Brown's office and this led to Governor Brown's personal involvement in an investigation of the mental health, uh, mental hospital system. And as a result of that, instead of really curtailing the activities of the psychiatrists as far as their drugging was concerned, what they did was uh, uh, appropriate a greater amount of money uh, to see that there was more staff in the hospitals, which they thought would reduce the need for drugs. There seems to be a uh, a relationship between the number of personnel you have taking care of people in these uh, institutions and uh, the amount of drugs that are used. The more people you have, the fewer, the less reliance uh, needed on these, on these terrible drugs. And uh, Madness Network News continued on to 1985 in Napa around the same time and then they just sort of faded away uh, part of our movement was uh, co-opted in the sense that there are a lot of people who are working within the movement uh, trying to really end these abuses who were given jobs to organize uh, psychiatric uh, survivors, psychiatric inmates, so that they would have more of a voice. But it didn't impinge that much upon the activities of the psychiatrists, but gave the survivors some hope that there'll be some real changes made and some of them set up daycare centers and there were some alternatives that were presented through this movement. It was, it was in some ways a very good movement but it was all legitimized by the state or various states and it was funded in part by the government and that right away took the edge off of the criticism because the people, you know, they couldn't really go that strongly against those who were actually funding their operations and their salaries. I don't believe overall that people are being treated in psychiatry better today than they were 35, 40 years ago. I don't think that the uh, fundamental facts have changed that much. As a matter of fact, in some ways, psychiatry is today even more abusive and is even more widely practiced than ever before. And it's not so much force that is being used, but that the public has been duped into accepting tri psychiatric treatment as a way of dealing with their personal problems. For example, back in 1970, you could count uh, the number of children who were on ADHD drugs in the tens of thousands, perhaps. Those drugs were, for that purpose, were just being introduced at that time. Today, there could be anywhere from five to nine million children taking these very, very powerful psychiatric drugs, not just the ADHD dr drugs, which is really a kind of stimulant drug like speed, only a very nicely packaged speed, which is legal and is prescribed by a medical doctor. In other words, now you don't have to go out onto the street to buy your speed. You can just get a prescription from a psychiatrist or any other kind of physician. They're giving these drugs to children without nearly the awareness and sensitivity to the problems that these drugs are going to cause in the long run. Because what they're doing is they're creating a junkie, a psychiatric junkie population. These kids are starting on the ADH drug the ADHD drugs or the stimulant drugs, they're becoming addicted to these drugs so that they can't get off them that easily. The result is that the great majority of people who are started on these drugs and who take them for two or three years become drug users after their youth is over. They become uh, alcoholics, they become users of street drugs, 
and they also become chronic mental patients because of the debility caused by the drugs. So they're frequently put on antipsychotic drugs and antidepressant drugs, and in this way they become chronic patients, probably people who will be on these very, very powerful, destructive drugs for the rest of their lives. And their lives as a result of taking these drugs unquestionably is, are going to be shortened and made, it made less creative and productive and joyful. They're ruining a whole generation of kids and the doctors without any uh, questioning just go along with all the promotion that the drugs are given by the pharmaceutical houses which make a fortune up from these drugs. It's the, it's the combination uh, of the pharmaceutical houses, uh, houses and the psychiatrists and the medical profession who have created what I call a, a pharmaceutical psychiatric medical complex, which is almost equivalent in destructiveness to the military industrial complex because it affects so many millions of people and the public just buys into it totally. They accept the word of the psychiatrist because the psychiatrist is a medical doctor. And just like in the Middle Ages, the inquisitors were priests and their word was accepted, not because they were inquisitors and did cruel things to people, but because they were priests who they had been conditioned to believe were holy men and would only advise people to do the right thing in order to save their souls. Well, today we have the psychiatrists as the members of the most, prof the most highly respected and honored profession, the medical profession. And here they are saying, take these drugs, they're good for you, they'll help you solve your problems. And uh, uh, they're in your best interest. And they're believed by the vast majority of people in, in society uh, because uh, they have the, all this credibility which... Uh, uh, it comes with being a medical doctor. And that coupled with the advertising uh, of the pharmaceutical house, you see the advertisements in magazines, take psychiatric drugs for bipolar and schizophrenia, and especially for depression.